Oh no, but that bad medicine. <laughs> Hi, Phil. Hey, um, is the air conditioner noisy? Can you hear it? Or should I turn it off? Question mark. <laughs> I'm not texting. I'm just talking. It's funny. Hi, Paul. Hi, Vicky. Hi, LK. Fourteen people already. You guys are fast. We're still trying. Oh, it's ex it's right on time. Transmission. All right, hold on a sec. Hi, Bruce. Hey, Al. So I can hear the air conditioning, but it's not really a problem. It's just like a really low thing in my head. Okay, cool. So you're going to start feeding back if you don't turn your audio down over there. <laughs> All right. So you got to turn yours down or put in a headset. Hey. We're trying to get Bruce Brand on speakerphone so that you guys can hear him talking too. All right, call me back when you figure it out. All right, so let's wait around a few more minutes and see um, if the audience picks up so that we don't have to repeat ourselves too much. Should I turn off the air conditioning? Is it making a droning noise in the background, or do, do you guys matter? Because it's like 110 degrees here. It's not too bad in the inside, but outdoors it's terrible. But if I turn it off, it'll get hot, and you'll watch me sweat. Twenty-eight people. Who came in? I guess I have to scroll. I'm new to this thing, so who's the half-naked guy behind you? That? That's dummy. <laughs> Can't hear it. Can you guys hear it all? The air is okay. Thanks, Patrick. Leave it on. Jeff Bradley, what's up, buddy? It's fine. Keep cool. Sound is good from here. Phil, keep it on. Can't hear it. Awesome. I can hear the AC. Can't hear the AC. What's up, Paul Long? Is this Paul Long from KNAC or another Paul Long that I'm unaware of? Hi, Jerry Vincent Parker, Karen Norman. Okay, so I guess uh, we'll start just for the uh, for information's sake. For the administrators of the tips and tricks group, I'm logged into the admin page as well. So if you want to type messages in there, I will see them and then we can talk behind the scenes as well. So this is our very first. Hey, Joe, how are you, buddy? Oh, I can't talk to you, Brittany Page. So this is our very first live stream, okay? And it's dedicated to the friends and family that operate within a group that I help manage. And uh, it's called Tips and Tricks with Cobra Class Leatherworking Equipment. Um, a lot of people don't know that I'm involved, involved with that group. And family that operate within. there's Bruce calling me back. He's trying to figure out how to um, minimize his feedback. Anyway, the Tips and Tricks group is a sewing machine user group for people that own industrial sewing machines 
like the machines that come from the Leather Machine Company in Southern California. The Leather Machine Company is owned and operated by a couple of friends of mine. And early on, I noticed that they were having a customer service problem in that there were very basic questions that people would call in about and they would get tangled up on the phone answering these questions all day long. Okay, and that seems to be an ongoing problem for them. And my attempt is to minimize the unnecessary conversations that clog up the customer service line, like tension problems and my my threat my thread is breaking every once in a while. And why is my thread looking like this? Like there's a loop on top or whatever like that. And any experienced operator knows that these types of problems um, are very short lived. Uh, there's a learning curve to running these machines. Once you get the hang of it, you kind of know how to adjust the tension and how to, you know, fix a fraying needle thread and, and all those kinds of things. So there's a moment in time when a new operator gets kind of stuck and doesn't really have these answers and there's nowhere to go. There's no people that are willing to help you. And I found out by experience a long time ago when I was just starting out that these sewing machine operator types, factory workers, for example, um, sewing machine mechanics, will not tell you how to fix your machine. They won't tell you how to do that because they're looking at it as job security. This Johnny come lately or Al come lately is going to take their job. Okay. Um, that's just simply not the case in this current environment. We have people that, and I call it bake sale money because I don't have an, an, another way to talk about it, but I have this mental picture of a mom who's finally raised her kids and she's been doing leather craft for a while. And then she gets her kids raised up to the point where they can go to kindergarten or first grade. Now she's got a little bit of time and she wants to raise some money for college fund. Okay. And she saves up all her money and gets this sewing machine delivered to her house. Cause there's going to be a big truck dropping off a pallet and setting it on the porch. And now mom, who's never owned a major sewing machine, she might have a home machine and she may have done some quilting, but she does a lot of hand sewing. Okay, are you following me so far? So this this mom saves up her money and pins her hopes and dreams for, for her children's future Incoming on this particular sewing machine. So she gets it in the house and then in turn, she forgets to hold the thread. And five minutes later, after having assembled the machine, the machine's out of whack. And the closest mechanic is an hour away. And that mechanic is going to charge door to door. He's going to charge 60 bucks an hour to travel an hour, tinker with the machine for five minutes, and charge an hour of time for that because there's a minimum of one hour of service, and then an hour to travel back. So that first mistake costs her three hours of labor, and she's distraught and doesn't know where to turn so then she calls the manufacturer and they go look you did it like this and, you, and now steve's on the phone for an hour trying to talk some lady through it well she's a mythical character nevertheless but you know i still i have i have had to go through that personally myself and it required me picking up the sewing machine putting it in the car driving into downtown los angeles and dealing with all the the rat race down there so i i i feel that now I don't want other people to have to do that. So you know what? Let's make this information easily accessible. So we start making some videos and then the tips and tricks channel comes, comes along and um, it only takes a couple minutes to refer someone to a video that we've done that the, the, a lot of these videos have got upwards of 10,000 views. That means 10,000 people were able to benefit from the simple information that we put out there. And then um, the phone didn't have to ring at the Leather Machine Company, and Steve's time is recaptured so that he can continue doing the cool product development things that make the Leather Machine Company cool, right? Like, th these people are so innovative, it's crazy. Just look at the center presser foot on the Class 4. You can see exactly where the needle is going to pierce the leather. I had never seen that in a sewing machine. They, they all had closed-tip feet, right? So if you're doing fine detail, 
and you can't see the needle. So here I'm doing this weird maneuver. And I was proud of myself for figuring out how to do it. I pushed the knee lift with my hand and then duck my head to the side and look under the foot, shine a flashlight so I could see where the needle was going, drop the foot, hand crank the machine and get my stitch in the right place. With that open toe foot, there's no more of that little ballerina dance trying to look under the foot. You just look at the needle and there it is. It's right in their place. Why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I take and modify the feet on my machine to do something like that? Because I was afraid to modify the machine. I was afraid to change the engineered parts on a FOF 1245 sewing machine that I've had for 20 years. So I'm inhibited by the machine itself. And I'm locked in this weird box where I can't really think outside the box. And then Steve, he's got lots of pressure feet. He goes and files one down, changes the characteristics of how that that foot works. And now you and I get to benefit from that because that foot makes it easy. It makes it easy to place the needle right where you want it. We take it for granted now. But before, that was really hard to place the needle in those locations. So there's that's just one example of a bunch of them that the leather machine company people have come, come across with. The flip down edge guide. Look at that thing. We take it for granted now. It's just a commonplace item. But you can stick a piece of material alongside of the edge guide, and another one can go underneath it. That's unheard of five years ago. You used to have a magnet edge guide. You can't slide anything underneath the magnet. They used to have those swinging edge guides that are very common in flatbed machines. You can't slide anything underneath it. So if you're going to do some top stitching on a, on a lap seam, for example, you raise the edge guide up a little bit and the extra material goes underneath it. Whoa, how easy is that, right? So um, it's really an awesome thing. And it takes people like Steve to, to come up with things like that. Okay, he has an idea because he's got spare time to think about it. So when he's locked up on the phone answering thread tension questions, he can't do those other cool things that he's doing. Okay, so the tips and tricks is to try to help that environment out so that we can give Steve some of his time back. And if you look at the top of the tips and tricks page, there's a little search engine there, right? You can put any question in there and it's probably been answered once or twice in the past. And if it wasn't answered to the way it makes sense for you, you can type in the whole new question again, and then we'll come in right away, usually, and answer it for you. And if if it's a long answer, we'll invite you to call. I have no problem talking to friendly people on the phone. I'll talk to you on the phone. And then hopefully you'll summarize it and it'll go into the archive and other people can benefit from your experience. That's the, the, the way of the tips and tricks. Through that path. And with that mindset, we've recruited a lot of cool people to help us. Bruce Brand, for example, he's sitting here on my phone waiting to help me answer these questions. We've got a back room. We call it the, um, the admin page. It's called the Tips and Tricks for Administrators. Only the admins of, that, of this group, the Tips and Tricks uh, with Cobra Class Leather Working Equipment, have access to that. So if I have a weird question that I can't answer, I can type it in there or I can call Dave and he'll answer and he'll post the picture in there for me. And then I'll give it to Bruce and then Bruce will answer. And it was a collective answer, but it's all represented by Bruce Brand or myself or, or Dave. But we'll have these conversations in the background. And that's what really makes this group powerful because it's a concerted effort amongst a bunch of people that are like-minded and want to help other people. OK, so the tips and tricks is a really awesome thing. And I, I get a lot of, of pride from being able to off, offer this kind of help, because when I was young, there was nobody out there for me. I just had to pay a lot of money for these mechanics to come over and I'd watch over their shoulder and I'd remember what they did and hopefully not break the machine when I went to try to do it myself. OK, uh, so that's kind of how the tips and tricks runs. OK, we have Vince Alvarado. Big bad Spider-Man Vince, he's he's Mr. Sharp. He takes care of all the sharp machines, the splitters and the bell skivers and stuff like that. And, you know, we put together a sharpening video 
where he came over to my shop to teach me how to sharpen my machine and how to switch out the blade and all that stuff. I had no idea how to do that before. Okay, understand that we accessed a vital resource that lives in California. He lives about an hour away from me. He came over to my place and then we videotaped it and put it up there so that everybody else can benefit from that. And all that information's in there. It's not very well presented because we're not really filmmakers, but it's all there. And you can use that at your convenience to adjust your machine. So we have good people like Vince helping us. Good people like Bruce and Dave and Cobra Steve to help us do all this stuff. So it makes us a very powerful organization. I'm proud of it. I hope you're proud of it. And, you know, we, we have a lot of long-term members. And, you know, we've surpassed a lot of that learning curve for a lot of folks. And we never hear from them again, but they're still in the membership. And every once in a while, they come up and give us an answer. Hopefully, it's the kind of answer that, that we need in this particular environment. Because there's a lot of ways to teach the same thing. We have a lot of old timers that have been around a long time. And um, this way I've been doing it for 50 years is not always the best way. Okay, we've learned from Steve because he answers that phone and he has to communicate these little tricks over the telephone, right? So it's got to be simple. There's advanced ways and then there's the simple way. And, the, and then there's the way that conveys it to the newbie who doesn't really know what the long groove is on the side of the needle and that it has to actually face the operator's left. Oh, wow, what is operator's left? Because, like... What does that really mean? Or what does past top dead center or past bottom dead center? A lot of people don't understand what those things are. We take it for granted. But, you know, operator's position is where he is sitting in front of the saw machine, right? So everything on the left is the operator's left. The needle is on the left. And the hand wheel is on the right, right? We just assume that people understand that. But if they don't, we're not going to berate them for not knowing that. We're going to educate them. And then the minute they get it, oh, my God. Then it's obvious, and then they never have to think twice about that. So I always refer to the machine as operator's left and operator's right. Okay? So whenever we're talking about the machine, if it's on the left, it's going to be on the operator's left. Okay? Okay, the past top dead center, past bottom dead center thing, the needle goes all the way up, can't go up any higher, and it starts to come down. That's past top dead center. Bottom dead center, the needle goes all the way down, cannot go down anymore, and it starts to go up. That's the bottom dead center, and as it starts coming up, it's past bottom dead center. So we refer to those moments, usually a quarter inch past top or past bottom dead center, so that the hook is in the relative position. Past bottom dead center, the hook has got a hold of the needle thread, and then you could pivot and not skip your stitches. We go heavily into that with the spiral pattern exercise on the YouTube channel. A lot of people have done that exercise, and a lot of people get very comfortable with operating their machine. Removing the material requires exactly 180 degrees opposite position of the needle. So the needle's at the top and then comes down a quarter inch past top dead center. Now at that point, the hook has completely released the thread and you can pull the, the material out of the needle very easily. But every once in a while, we get somebody who's got three threads coming out of the throat, right? So that tells us right away that they haven't cycled the machine all the way. So cycle the machine, quarter inch past top dead center, and it lets go of the thread. It's hard to communicate that because they don't understand some of that so we have to tell them once or twice and then they go oh i get it now uh -huh. and then they never have that problem ever again and you know i'm patient i think bruce is patient lol he's 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 a grumpy he's the grumpy gus every once in a while but you know what we get this information out there and it hopefully helps people we have our common theme the only thing we ever ask is what who knows who can type it into the comment section come on somebody type Come on, Bruce, you can type it. I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> can you guys hear Bruce? Say something, Bruce. Say hi. Say something, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. 
Bruce and his little sarcastic self. Anyway, here he's he's in there. He can hear us, and if we have a question for him, he'll be happy to answer. As long as you guys can hear it. Pat, Big Ron, pass it forward. All right, everybody. There's Zena. She says, "Yes, you are." LOL. Okay. Hi, Zena. Pay it forward. Pay it forward. Pay it forward. So yeah, that's the whole thing. You know, we offer our help in hopes that you can share it to someone else. You know, this is like in my own imagination, because my head's about this big, right? This is my industrial revolution. One thread snag at a time. My hope is that you as the user can develop a, a little company or a big company even better and put some people to work, create some jobs and put some meals on some tables not just for yourself, but for other people. Create an environment where leather is actually a, a, a viable industry. You know, and, and, and enough complaining about Walmart selling the $10 belt. Like, why aren't we selling $10 belts? We, everybody thinks that it's impossible. I think I can do $10 belts. I know that I can. I just have to buy a lot of leather, and I have to produce them really quick. I can do it. I can buy a truckload of leather and I can push it all through the strap cutter and I can put the end cutter through the clicker. I can do it. Do I want to personally do it? I don't want to alter my career path very much. But um, hey, William Dawson, how are you, buddy? Long time follower over there, William Dawson saying hello. So um, we can do it. We can we can band together and we can take some of that work away from the overseas people. We just have to be smart about it. We have to put in some effort. We can't we can't sit there and stagnate and complain about Walmart and the importers. Those importers are doing it. Why can't we? It's not that their labor is so much cheaper. They just work smarter than we do sometimes. They have more efficient machinery. I have a strap cutter. I can cut 10 belts at a time. Boom or at least 10 straps, I, I've got a clicker. I can click out the ends pretty darn quick. Okay, so there's no real excuses. It's just being aware of what those things require. I come from an industrial background, right? I've, I've been doing leather craft for a very long time. I don't consider myself a craftsman anymore. I consider myself, an, you know, a professional working uh, leather maker. I'm a supervisor. I used to work at Guest Jeans, right? I used to supervise 400 operators a day, and that plant operated three shifts, so 1,200 people a day sewing in there, okay? You wonder how many pairs of jeans come out of there. Come on, think about it, 1,200 people working in a 24-hour period. Well, you know what happened to that factory? It died with NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. A week later, that plant was in, in, in Mexico, in Ensenada. I didn't want to move. I lost my job. And instead of paying income taxes, I collected unemployment. So our society lost the benefit of my income tax. Then our society lost the tariff because the North American Free Trade Agreement allowed us to send work over there and not tax it on the way back through the border. So we lost twice there. The income tax, we lost the unemployment benefit money, and then we lost the import tax. Okay, that was a bad deal. It made products cheaper, great. It destroyed manufacturing. All the factories disappeared in Los Angeles almost overnight. Okay, so now what do we have? We have a bunch of old sewing machines laying around trying to be resold so we can go buy a junk used piece of metal with old style um, distribution methodologies, people coveting their trade secrets, selling you a piece of junk, hoping to get it out of their showroom. And now you've got this machine there and no help learning how to use it. Right. So that method doesn't fly for me. Let's get you a nice machine that's designed and dedicated to the task that you need. So which machine do you really need? Let's get that one optimized for the job that you want to do. OK, so 
that's a, that that's a gray area too, isn't it? Because is the class four the the best machine for you, or sorry about that? Is the class four the best machine for you, or is the or is the class eighteen? What machine works better for you? Do you need a class seventeen, a fifty five fifty BB? Because that is a phenomenal sewing machine. People don't even know about it. Okay, because we spend a lot of time talking about the class four. I love the class four. I use my class four every single day, bar none. That is my guitar strap making sewing machine. I rarely have a problem with it. If I have a problem, it's because I did it, not the machine. But it's dedicated to one task. I don't fiddle with it. I'm not trying to be a craftsperson making a wallet one day and a belt the next day and a satchel the next. If I want to make satchels, I'm making them on the 26 right here. Right? I got that machine dedicated to making bags like that. I don't alter it a whole lot. I don't change the configuration. I just walk up and do the job that I've designed for that machine and do it. And it works. It works well because I'm not fidgeting. I'm not altering it all the time. Okay. So which machine actually is the best for you? And we get that question a lot, right? We get that question in the tips and tricks. I'm looking to buy a new sewing machine. I don't know what to get. What do you think is the best machine for me? I'm going to make a wallet and then I'm going to make a belt. And then I want to make pouches. I want to make saddlebags. Wow, that sounds like two or three different machines to me. But what, what do you really want to do? first how long have you been sewing oh i'm just starting out okay well what do i normally say when you're telling me you're just starting out who knows come on i've i've asked that question to everybody a bunch of times what what do i say when you tell me you're just starting out probably don't have an answer because we don't pound it into the into the common group but you know we say do one thing and do it really well for a while go out and make a hundred belts once you cross over the hundred belt it's pretty easy to adjust the tensions and adjust the pressure to start making wallets then go out and make a hundred wallets you're gonna have to shorten your stitch length probably use a smaller needle and smaller thread so that learning curve is pretty easy at that point after you make your hundred wallets Let's make a hundred little hip bags or something. Then those processes become second nature because you've done it so many times. But if you make a belt today and you want to make a holster tomorrow, I'm telling you, you're going to have a problem. If you don't know how to sew a belt, now you're trying to sew a thick holster, forget about it. It's, it's, it's task loading on a level that makes it almost impossible to learn anything because now you're just frustrated. You're breaking needles, loops on top, loops on the bottom. You're trying to figure out how this stupid machine doesn't work for you. And it's nothing but frustration. So go make 100 belts, and then we'll transition to a wallet or a holster. And then go make 100 of those holsters. We always suggest testing on scrap, right? So how many times have we seen somebody show us an example of bad stitching on a piece of scrap that doesn't look anything like a work piece? I'm just looking at it going, okay, well, they're practicing, but they're not practicing with any formality that's going to guide them into something that they can build skills upon. Okay, so I end up saying, hey, give me a call or I'll private message them and say, look, you know what, try to set it up so that it looks like a work piece looks like something that you want to build next week or next month and then develop that skill loading that particular type of item into the machine controlling the thread maybe chaining off onto the next piece right remember the spiral exercise has the chaining off segment in it that's a very powerful tool okay so load unload stitch correctly offload but if you don't have scrap pieces that resemble work pieces you're never going to get it and you're just going to have nothing but frustration so i got to help these folks backpedal and see that so that that way they can develop and once you start doing a hundred belts you've got intuition behind the machine and I, and i and i tell this to people all the time that you know once you start 
getting into a routine, you start noticing things that are happening with the machine before they happen. Like you can hear the bobbin running out of thread because it starts to chatter a little bit. The sound changes just a little bit, right? Who wants to run out of bobbin in the middle of the thing? So if I can hear it chattering, I know it's coming, coming up. I'm not surprised when it runs out. That comes from a little experience. You know that, you know, you can probably sew eight belts, eight average length belts with one bobbin, just the perimeter. Boom, boom. Okay. You try to do nine, you're going to run out. So now you're going to have to splice in the thread. That's no good. So stop at eight and throw away a couple feet of thread. Big deal. But you have to count and you have to live through that experience at least once or twice and make a conscious decision to not let that happen. And the minute you do that, guess what? You're a better craftsperson, right? You have less frustration in the shop because you're not going, not living through another tinker's dam going, damn it, I ran out of thread. Ah! I hate that. I hate having that frustration. Our jobs are difficult. This is a tough industry. This is a tough day at work, right? I don't need to fight myself when I'm at the machine or at the cutting table, right? But it's very natural to do that if you don't have intuition into what you're doing and pre-plan through some level of experience that you don't want to run out of bobbin. Count how many belts you can get, make a note, and then pile up six, seven belts, and then change the bobbin when you get to the last one. Ta-da! Spare yourself a hassle, right? So that's kind of the way I look at making stuff. I like making the same thing over and over because guess what? I don't have to adjust my setup too much. That helps a lot. What's Heather McDonald have to say? How, how many partial bobbins of thread do you have, Al? I don't save empty bobbins. If it's pretty close to like the quarter way through, I just kind of just dump it and put it on the winder again. Thread's cheap. And then trying to manage inventory of, of small bobbins, I, I, I don't do small crafty things, so I don't need two inches of sewing. I'm going to sew, you know, an entire 50-inch guitar strap. So if it's getting low and it's not going to do it, I'm just pulling all the thread out and throwing it away. Um, anyway, what was I saying? We were talking about um, making stuff and producing and 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 saving saving time from the frustrations of being a leather worker and not having to endure the Tinker's Dam, right? So the Tinker's Dam, you know, you know, you've heard that before. You've you've done it before yourself. You drop your pencil and go grumble, grumble under your breath. Arr. Well, you know, by the end of the day, a, a, a hundred of those, and now I'm in a bad mood. I don't need that. I don't need that in my head. I don't need it you know, in my heart and, and my family doesn't need that guy around, right? I can be a very grumpy, very aggressive person. I'm a very driven person. And at the end of the day of a frustrating day and I'm mad and my girlfriend walks in and interrupts me, man, she gets the evil eye. She doesn't deserve that because I didn't plan my workday efficiently, right? I got to spare these people that experience. I have to be very in tune with what my head is doing so that I don't impose the evil that comes out from a long, frustrating day. So guess what? Breathe and plan and, and, and exercise a, a certain level of control over my environment so that I'm not making mistakes and frustrating myself. You know, that's a, that, that's a very important thing, because if you're doing this stuff a long time, you don't want to make yourself old and, and grumpy and be that guy. I don't want to be that grumpy old jerk behind the sewing machine all day long. No, man. Tips and tricks gives me a lot of satisfaction. I, I, I get a lot of pride. You know, I get I, I feel really good after helping somebody makes me makes my day a nice day. So people think, you know, that they're they're interfering with me a lot. Not to the contrary. It makes me a very happy person to be able to help these people. It gives me pride and it raises me up and hopefully I've raised them up and that we all rise up together. Right? 
So that's kind of fun and kind of cool. So uh, let's switch gears. What's on your bench today? Come on, let's see. Let's let, let's let's hear some. Uh... Hey, there's Belle Baudelaire. That's Pam. That's my sweetheart. I love that lady. <laughs> I said it in public too. Ha, ha Pam. All right. So let's see. What what are you guys making? What what kind of stuff do you like to make? What are you going to make a hundred of? Let's see some comments over here. I mainly use pre-wound but the pre-wounds are are very cool. You know, if if you are, if only what using one or two colors and you can stock them up, but it to for me winding on the winder is second nature. I just take it off, put the next one up there and let it wind up. It's they're full all the time. You get a little more thread in the pre-wound bobbin, so that's kind of a benefit. Purse totes and bags, Patrick. What kind of machine are you using? Paul, backstitching. What's that all about, buddy? Heather McDonald, I'm using leather and wax canvas bags. Okay. Jeff Bradley, finishing up a motorcycle seat currently. Oh, man, you can have that market. I don't want anything to do with it. It's too much. It's too specialized. Holsters, holsters, and more holsters. Dude, I, I've got a uh, H&K 45 that needs a good holster. Pam whips. <laughs> and we made a whip the other day. Dog collars and handbags. Peggy, what kind of machine are you using? Dog collars, handbags, and what machine? Watch bands and trading cards. Wow, right on. Are you in Peter Main's group, Sherry? Watch bands are good, profitable things. Custom lesions. Hi, Susan. What machines? What machines? Practicing boob top stitching. Wow. You got to get with uh, Lisa Sorrell because she's the queen of that, man. She, the work that she does is beautiful. Customer service is wonderful. Y'all went above and beyond with my class 26. Well, I didn't do anything with that because I don't work for the leather machine company, but those guys, they, they appreciate your props. Firefighter leather, suspenders and radios. Sounds like a lot of class fours out there. Biker wallets, a class four. Wow. Biker wallets with a class four. That's a little on the... um. On the lightweight side, what kind of thread and what kind of needle are you using? Small handmade earrings for outdoor market. Purses and hats, but need this. Small filler stuff. Of course, you always have to have a rounded out group of products. Not my bread and butter, but first time doing kangaroo. Oh, I, 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 my hands are tired. I can't, I can't do hand lacing anymore. I will, but I don't like doing it. William Dawson. Scrub caps. I'm glad that that's working out for you, buddy. Talk about sewing stretch fabric one direction. Yeah, dude, uh, you need a cover stitch machine for that. Cobra 4 and and the, the holsters. Good man. Adam. Adam the man, the long-term user here. Heather McDonald, do you recommend different machines or adjusting the one machine you have? Well, I don't have one machine. I have 30 of them. I have I, I set my machines up for one task and that's it. So I have a class four, a class 26. So the class four is running 346 bonded nylon with a 25 or a 26 needle. And the class uh, 26 is usually running 138 and a 22 or a 23 needle. So yeah, um, two machines, three machines, four machines. I have a, uh, I'm sitting at a 5550 BB with a normal drop feed attachment on it so that I can sell muslin because I'm making a pair of chaps for a customer in Las Vegas and I don't want to drive out there for a fitting. So I'm going to make a muslin and I'm going to ship it to him and have him make all the markings where I instruct him to do. And then I'll get it back and then translate that into a leather pattern and then ultimately build it. I'll build that set of chaps on the class 17 or the class 18, right? Because I find that the 17 handles medium to lighter weight materials better than the 18 does, right? I had um, asked the same question a million times about how to um, how people like Yves Saint Laurent and Chanel and Dior can sew leather and you can't see any variation in the, in the surface of the material. But when I sew light leather, I get this wrinkly wave in the distortion of them from the needle and the thread wrinkling these ultra soft materials. And like for years, how do I do that? I can't emulate the work that they're doing, but I know they're doing it because I can see it. How do I sew a piece of lambskin so it looks like a sheet of glass. How do you sew two layers of mylar for a satellite that's going up in space? Right? 
I'm looking for the right job. I'm looking for an industrial job where somebody's going to pay me 150 bucks an hour, eight hours a day for, you know, a month at a time. I want to make satellite covers. I want to make space suits. It's a little bit outside of the leather thing, but I need a high profile, high paying job just like everybody else. The guy who knows how to sew satellite blankets, you know, those Mylar covers on the satellites are all usually gold color. Somebody sews those together. I went on an audition at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I failed. I didn't know how to sew it. Somebody knows how to do that. The, the, the blankets have to be perfectly smooth in the seams. So what machine are they doing? If anybody knows how to answer that question, I know the answer now. But it was an ongoing question. I had to ask Steve a bunch of times. Hey, dude, I'm getting this problem with this this machine. What do I do? I'm trying to sew these um, lightweight shirts. I had a customer wanted a, a hundred um, pig suede shirts, the super light pig suede. And every time I'd sew it, there was a wrinkle. So what do I do? Guess what? I was using the Class 18, a compound feed machine. The minute... We switched over to the class 17. That problem went away about 90% of it. The minute we got the 5550 BB, it went away completely. So think about it. What's the difference between the 17, the 18, and the 5550 BB that allows for really lightweight material? The compound feed exacerbates the problem because the foot the, the, the feed dog drops below the table and the needle undulates the material, introducing this weird little stretch. So while the Class 18 is a really cool sewing machine, don't get me wrong, but it's got its place in the shop. The Class 17 is only walking foot. It's not compound feed. So there's none of that undulation underneath the feed dog. Right? So it provides a smoother finish. The 5550 is a roller foot compared to a walking foot. So that doesn't stress the material at all. And guess what? It makes a beautiful lightweight garment. Beautiful. 5550 BB, the answer to that problem. I haven't sewn any Mylar. God, I got to get some uh, aerospace Mylar and see if I can do it. Because... The job I went to, to to Jet Propulsion for to get, the guys that sewed those blankets, you'll remember maybe 25 years ago, they sent a satellite up and it blew up in space. The radiation from the sun killed it because the blankets failed. I'm glad it wasn't me. Right? I didn't blow it. They blew it. But it presented a problem and it took about 20 years for me to actually figure out the answer. Now, I've never discussed this subject. It's always been a puzzle. Like any craftsperson, like I'm always looking for that next thing. Uh, by no means have I mastered this leather craft thing at all. I'm pretty good at some things. I'm really good at others. And I know that there's a lot of stuff that I can't do. Right? Bar none. Go look at Peter Main's work. Go look at Chan Gear. I don't even... I. I own a swivel knife just for the fun of owning it, but forget about it. I can't tool anything. You know, if I'm lucky, I can get a block letter out. Right? Come on. I'm a tailor by trade, but I'm always trying to learn new things. You know, that's what's fascinating about this industry is that there's so much to do and there's so many people out there. There are so many customers you just have to be smart enough to figure out how to get to them, how to make a interesting enough product that people want to buy it. I have my niche, right? I, 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 I work in motion picture and music. My foundation came out of music. I got started making leather for musicians. Okay. So I understand the day in the life of a musician that's on the road, the working musician. I understand his day. I understand the the needs that he has so I can custom tailor my offerings for them. Okay. My guitar straps, the guitar straps I make, they're not cheap. I'm the first person to tell you. Okay. But they're designed to hold up very expensive guitars. Okay. 
one of the guitars that I've uh, I've held up fifty thousand dollar guitars with with a fifty dollar piece of leather. Okay, if that guitar strap fails and that guitar breaks, drop it on the headstock and knock the headstock off that thing. I'm liable for it. Okay, so my engineering goes into making my guitar straps to hold up instruments like that. Okay? You're not going to use a three ounce piece of veg to do that. Trust me. So I speak their language. I understand their needs and I can provide them a service that they can only really get from me because if you don't understand what their requirements are, you can't design for it. I can make leather pants really well. I make people look really nice in leather pants, but my pants don't fall apart. Even though they're non-stretch fabric and they're tight as tight can be. Excuse me, I'm going to take a sip. With that being said, I make these clothes. I use the right, it's all in the needle, by the way. I use the right needle and the right thread so that the the, the material doesn't fall apart as it would if the lady at the dry cleaner who thinks she's my competitor built it, right? Because she can sew, she has equipment, she's high profile, and but she doesn't speak the same language. I'm a professional leathersmith that works in rock and roll, and I understand the stresses that that environment puts on the leather. You see that there's, there's, there's some insight there that makes me viable because my competitor is a minimum wage worker. You understand that, right? The lady at the dry cleaner who is ready to sew has that level of skill, but she'll sew it for you. But you come and see me and it's a whole different experience, right? And that's what makes me viable. What makes it work for you? Okay, if you're sitting there going to the same trade trade fair with four other people that are making halters, then it becomes a commodity item and a popularity contest, right? So how do we get noticed and how do we get seen so that the customer wants to buy from us? Adam, he sews holsters. I don't do a lot of holsters. I do prop holsters, right? They don't really have to hold guns. If you want to carry a gun and you want it not to fall out of the dang holster, you better call Adam because I'm not your guy. Adam does it every day. Adam does a really nice job, right? You want a concealed carry or a open carry holster? That's your guy. Don't talk to me about it because I'm no good at that. But I can make a really cool holster, and I've done TV holsters. I did the, the shotgun holster for the Terminator. Remember the motorcycle when he jumped off the bridge and there was a shotgun on the bike? I did that. Okay, no big deal. Like, just a bunch of rivets holding the stupid thing together. But, you know, I'm no way a, a holster maker. <laughs> Forget about it. But I'll make you a pair of pants. Anyway. Where are we going? Where's this conversation going? Pick a topic. Somebody tell me something. Paul Bexley, COVID-26, reverse on sewing machine doesn't look as good as turning the material around. Why do you think that is? Paul's not getting his stitches looking as good going backwards as if he spins it around and sews straight again. What happens in the machine and what creates the different look in the stitch? Let's noodle on that for a minute while I take another sip. The thread is arcing in the opposite direction, right? If it's going forward, it's coming off the front of the feed dog. If it's going backwards, it's coming off the back of the feed dog, right? Look at the shape of the hole in the feed dog. There's a cause and effect there. It's laying the thread slightly different. If you want to overcome that and overwhelm that and force it, then I would recommend tightening both tension devices, the top and the bottom, and then the knot's going to get tighter. Okay, And then 
hopefully look a little bit better. But guess what? If you're sewing mylar, it's going to crinkle it all. <laughs> it's going to crinkle it all together. So there's a cause and effect, right? You got to put it on the scale. Is the benefit outweighed by the outcome? Right? What 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 result do you want? Put it on that scale and make a decision. That's that's part of being a craftsperson. Part of being a shop manager, right? I have to decide. I have to. I, it's my shop, my rules. Your shop, your rules. And guess what? We're in America, so you're free to have that, right? If you work for me, you got to do it my way. I work for you. I'm. I come over to your shop to work. I'm doing whatever you want from me. I'll give you a couple options. But I'm not going to argue with you. You want it to look like that? That's what we're doing all day long. Whatever you need. Cindy's using the class 26. Hi, Cindy. Where's everybody from? I'm on I'm in Los Angeles. Got a lot of East Coasters out there. This whole Facebook Live is a funny thing. I feel like a talking head. Remember Max Headroom? It was an old TV show back in the, like, I guess it was in the 80s. Oh, you guys want some updates on sewing with Al Bain and uh, all that guys kind of stuff? Let's go down that path. How, what do you think? Okay, so at the beginning of the quarantine, I was worried for my friends. I figured all of my friends are going to sit around drinking Jack Daniels all day long and, and, and having hangovers and having nothing to do, right? So I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to offer people something to do, hopefully give them a little bit of education and the ability. Well, wow, there's all kinds of comments I, I haven't been reading. I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to give them something to do so that they could elevate their skills and then ultimately maybe... Um, add a product to their product line so that they can increase their marketability and their presence in the marketplace, right? So we taught a class um, on making a vest. Okay, that class was dedicated to making a muslin vest. And if you don't know what muslin is, it's a lightweight fabric that's non-stretchy. It's usually cotton and it's just a woven fabric and it's fairly cheap. That's usually about $3 a yard and a vest takes about two and a half, maybe three yards. We had some really good help with that process. Joe Vecarelli from uh, French European helped us with the distribution. I mean, the, the quarantine at the very beginning, come on, remember what happened? We couldn't go anywhere. Everybody was closed down. The, the, the cotton industry, there was no cotton to be bought. You couldn't buy it. Everybody started making masks and there was nothing. And then the, 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 the supplies were locked up in warehouses where the warehouse workers couldn't get it shipped out. So muslin was in short supply, but Joe Vaccarelli went out and got a bunch of it and, and helped us distribute that to the customers that, or the, the students that were taking the class. We formed a, cl uh, a Google Classroom class. We use this platform on Google called the Google Classroom. And with the help of good people like Bruce Brand, we um, taught some lessons. Okay, basically we taught the foundations for building garments. So we taught how to handle a marker, which is a basic paper pattern, and how to mount it on paper, on tag board or cardboard or pizza boxes, depending, because we have the battlefield methods. If you run out of something, you still have to get through your day. Well. We teach people how to overcome some of those obstacles. So we mounted um, cardboard. We mounted on pizza boxes. We mounted on corrugated boxes and, and how to handle your, 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 um, your pattern in that environment, how to store the pattern properly. Like I have a pattern library. I'll see if I can show it to you. It's way back there in the other end of the room. I don't know if I can see, you can see it, but it's basically a garment rack with hundreds of patterns on it and you have to catalog that stuff pretty well or else you can't find what you're looking for so that how to how to manage those patterns it was a it's a lesson on that okay at the end of the day or at the end of the two weeks um most people who signed up were able to complete the garment so we taught them how to stitch it and then i i i used a theme 
call it, and I call it the brain dump. Okay. Um, I would speak what I'm thinking while I'm sewing so that hopefully you can hear what I'm thinking before I get to the problem. So it would sound something like this. Okay, I'm going to load this material in. I'm going to hold my thread for three stitches and I'm going to on tack. Then I'm going to sew full speed for the next six inches and then stop before I have to make a turn. And when I get to that corner, I'm going to drop the needle to the past bottom dead center moment, use my knee lift, rotate the material, and then sew very slowly around the curve, making sure to follow the edge guide. Stitch, 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 stitch. Listen for the bobbin as it running out of thread. Keep an eye on the tension device. So, 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 so. Get to the end, off tack and then chain in the next workpiece so that I don't have to hold the thread. And that, that kind of brain dump, I think, helps people understand what they're seeing and why they're seeing it, and hopefully translate that into how your brain should be thinking when you're approaching a project in that fashion. And I, I, I don't know whether people actually enjoy what we did, but everybody completed the work and they turned in decent work. The classroom allows us to um, give you a workbook so and a summary and upload a video. So the students were able to upload um, pictures of their work and get critique behind the scenes. So it wasn't an embarrassing thing where, you know, you stitch terribly, you got to redo that. None of that. We don't thrive on that kind of stuff. You know, looks nice, but maybe take out that little segment and sew a little straighter there. Be more diligent with your edge guide. A little constructive criticism. And everybody got through the project. Okay. So um, that was quarantine time. We weren't allowed to have guests over to help us or any of that kind of stuff. The protocols weren't established for, for interacting with other people. So I did that with my cell phone, handheld the day before publishing. So we set up a really brutal schedule. I didn't realize how hard it was going to be where we we said three days a week, we're going to upload these, these lessons. So Monday, I think it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday uploading, and I'm videotaping, holding the phone in my hand the next day. And it's a 45 minute video that took me eight or 10 hours to do because I'm holding a phone like this, trying to videotape while I'm sewing. Oh my gosh, can't. And so some of the stuff's a little out of focus or out of frame. But we proved that the method would work. We proved that um, the information could be handed off to a student that way. And before we did it, we looked all over the place for online lesson plans and, and how these. Um, these lessons go. And there's a lot of people that will teach you how to sew on YouTube. But there's no interaction with the instructor. There's no feedback from the instructor. Okay, so you can go watch a, a tutorial, but good luck. The instructors don't know whether it actually worked or not because they're putting out product, but like, did does the end user actually follow and and succeed so with the google classroom you're posting your results and we know that it worked bar none we know everybody completed their work and they got it done and basically everybody there was there's it's a pass or fail thing and nobody failed and everybody built it and they tried it on and they, they know they got it so the next level of that class is to build the leather version instead of a muslin version okay so to that end, I've recruited some people to help me, okay? Um, a wonderful friend of mine and Pam's, my girlfriend's friend, childhood friend of hers. Her name is Aylin Kelly. Hopefully she's here listening to this. She's a member of this group. She doesn't really sew, but she is a very, very talented filmmaker. She works at Netflix, and she's a director of... Um, animation and stuff like that she's she's an editor and a director okay so she knows filmmaking and she has agreed to help me shoot the next segments of sewing with Al Bain and the leather version 
Okay, so hopefully we can get that stuff produced and, and up and running. Okay, to that end, my friend Denny owns a company um, where they do on-site video services, and he's got a um, six-camera system. Okay, so instead of being shot with a cell phone or a single hand, you know, handheld uh, DSLR rig, he's going to set up six cameras from six different directions so that he can just watch me sew, and then Aylin can edit it all together and, and make it simple and streamlined and hopefully present it in a way where people can actually take what they learned from the muslin class and adapt it to leather. And then hopefully at the end of all that, you can make a leather garment and add another product to your collection. Okay, so from belts and wallets and totes to leather vests, and then a vest is not that much more complicated to make a jacket. Leather jackets, trench coats, tail coats, tuxedos, dresses, skirts, you name it. Once you have those little skills, it's not a real big step to learn the next step. And I want to empower people, especially through this damn quarantine, man. I mean, is this stuff ever going to end? I'm tired of wearing a mask everywhere I go. I mean, don't you want to see this handsome face? <laughs> I know it's an improvement when I put my mask on. Yeah, <laughs> your money or your life. But uh, yeah, all kidding aside, you know, we have to stick through this. And if we can use this time to educate some people, then we all win, right? And that's that, that's really why what the pay it forward thing is all about, isn't it? Let me take another sip. I'm talking a lot, getting dry. So we have, with Alan's help, one video that's about to be released. We've done the uh, 5550BB instruction video for the leather machine folks. Okay, so that thing took quite a bit of effort to to shoot it, but I mean it's going to be a pretty video. The everything's in focus and and there's there's professional audio and professional editing versus my stuff that I do with my phone you know people people tend to tell me they like my my grassroots approach to things but you know what when when we're talking about high detail stuff it's nice to have a good camera and it's nice to have somebody who's actually holding the camera and focusing it correctly so Aylin uh, is almost done editing that thing and then we're gonna start with uh, the classroom stuff. We'll bring Joe Vaccarelli. You know, we did um, an interview with Mr. Vaccarelli about um, his his services that he offers from French European and the custom nature of dress forms and all of that stuff. And I don't know if you guys own or use mannequins with what you do, but I mean, it's on this side. The dress form for me is an indispensable tool. And what he does is he makes them custom fit for the for the customer. Okay, so literally, you take a bunch of measurements, or he has a scanning machine where he scans the body. And just think about a film like Game of Thrones, where they've got hundreds and hundreds of costumes on like ten principal players. Those players aren't standing there for fittings every single day. They make a custom fit mannequin for the player. They'll make five or six of them for a costume department for the for the main actors, right? So they, they'll build these garments, these intricate garments on these custom fit mannequins. And then they go try it on the, on the, on the actor and it fits perfect. Imagine that. Joe Vaccarelli is the guy for that and all of the other support resources that are necessary in those kinds of workrooms. All the rulers and pins and cutting devices that you could ever imagine. Joe Vaccarelli, French European, been my friend for a long time. He's helped me enormously, like you have no idea. But, you know, I was lucky enough to meet him early on at the beginning of my career and, and just start using those kinds of tools because... You know, if you're if you're doing the craft department at Hobby Lobby, those those tools don't really work. You know, compare an Exacto blade to a a, a Terry Nipshield knife. <laughs> Come on, 
<laughs> it's a joke. I mean, I can use an exacto, trust me. But you go get a leather wrangler knife, forget about it. It's night and day difference. And it makes the job easier. Remember, we were talking about not frustrating the heck out of yourself in the workday? Those tools help a lot. Okay, Hobby Lobby tools. No, Hobby Lobby cutting machines. Hobby Lobby. It's, except the Cricut, the Cricut cutter, that thing's awesome. We can talk about that later, but we just got one the other day because uh, it's going to make inlay and applique stuff a whole different thing. But, yeah, you have to have the right tools and you have to have the right resources and the right people supporting it. That's why the leather machine company is so cool. These people know what they're doing. Joe Vecarelli knows what he's doing. He speaks the language. He's, he's there providing the proper services that I need to run my workroom, okay? So I think we're in good hands with the people that help us, you know, Cobra Steve and Dave and Vince and, and Tony. Oh, my God, I've learned so much about sewing machines from Tony, you know? Jeff Bradley says he bought a pair of 10-inch shears from Joe Vecarelli, Vecarelli, and they're amazing. Yeah, I got like five pairs of those things. I have an endorsement through Kai Scissors also. They they supply me with scissors, but Joe's scissors are awesome, you know. But they, they he doesn't offer all the little itty-bitty ones, those really tiny ones for reaching in there and getting that last little nibble of thread. Joe doesn't have those. Maybe soon he will, but, you know, there's no one resource for it, uh, it, for it all. You know, you got to have lots of different vendors for different backup supplies. Like, I use Save More Leather. A lot. I mean, they're they're my primary supply house. So those people have been my friends since I was a kid. And uh, I, I use specifically three kinds of leather that they, they supply there. They have a Leone, which is a heavy in, um, upholstery material. Then they have this stuff they call skinny, which is otherwise known as plonge. And then some lambskins. Okay, so I buy that stuff from them. I buy all my hardware from them, snaps and rivets and grommets and buckles and stuff. Any, if, I can, if I'm buying leather, that's the first place I want to spend my money because they've always been good for me. Then there's a couple other places that specialize in things like shoe findings, okay, the dyes and, and, and the glues and stuff like that for, for the boot making and shoe making industry. I buy from Sederma Leather. But, you know, um, I've got so I've got more than one resource for that. I've got more than one resource for sewing machines. But um, because the leather machine company doesn't do, you know, normal textiles, There's, their stuff is for, for leather. And, you know, I have to buy cover stitch machines and overlocks and flat lock machines and buttonhole machines. I have resources for those machines too. Um, unfortunately, Leather Machine Company just has a specialty, okay? And that that's the common bond that brings us all all together. But you know, um, Vampire Rockstar or Pam or Belle Baudelaire, depending on what we want to call her, um, she's a women's wear, ready to wear maker, and she makes you know women's theatrical clothing. So there's a lot of spandex that comes through my shop in her workroom. Okay, so she's got overlocks and cover stitches and button setting machines and buttonhole machines and all of those other things that don't normally appear in a leather shop. But, you know, there they are. And we have to have resources for those vendors. So um, if you have questions on that kind of stuff, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. I just would prefer not to clog up the, the tips and tricks with that because it is a leather working environment. And to that end, I have a page called the Reese 101, which is a buttonhole machine. The Reese 101 is a classic buttonhole making machine. It does a keyhole buttonhole like you would see in, in your Levi's. Okay, so it's a heavy, heavy buttonhole machine. So there's that. And then we've got the Sewing with Al Bain page, which is where we're teaching our lessons from. So um, you're free to ask me questions about those kinds of machines in either of those environments or by private message. I, I don't mind receiving a message from a friend. So, you know, leather is a really cool thing. And this community that we're in and um, helping these people and and creating our own little industrial revolution, air quotes, getting getting people running so that they can create jobs for other people and building their little kids' college funds, I, I'm all for it. 
all for it. I'm telling you, I love doing this. I love, I love uh, these people. I've, I've, I've made some friends here, like some people like Jimmy Sullivan, man. That guy's like one of the nicest guys on earth. Bruce Brand. Oh my God. I, if anything were to happen to these people, I'd be crushed. Steve and Dave, Vince Alvarado, Spider-Man. Great people, man. We're surrounded with cool people. We're stronger together than we are apart. Anyway, ask me a sewing machine question. Let's talk about some sewing stuff. Let's change the subject from, from all the, the hugs and kisses. I'm going to take another drink. Hello, Elizabeth. 34 people watching the talking head of Al Bain. Where's Cover Steve? I don't see him. Did Dave ever show up? Can you talk about presser foot marks in the leather? I get marks on almost all leather. I have a new Cobra 26. Okay. And how similar is a Cowboy 45 to a Class 4? I don't know the 4500, but Bruce does. Okay. If it's a 441 clone, then it's exactly the same thing. It's just slightly different in the accessories that have been put into making the machine. I compare that, and I will get back to... Uh, to the question about the 26 in a moment. Okay. So I compare the 441s like a, um, a car. Okay. I live in Los Angeles. I drive around. Sometimes I have VIPs in my car, whatever. I need a sedan and a lot of air conditioning and extra charger ports. So I might actually install an extra lighter and a charger in the back seat. Okay, the same car out in the Midwest driving back and forth and, and taking the kids to, to school and, and over to soccer practice might need slightly different accessories in it. You know, I might need a, a, a tranny cooler where the standard transmission works fine for another car. So these sewing machines are a lot like those cars. You know, they get specific parts designed by people like Steve and Dave to make them work more efficiently in the particular environment, specifically a leather environment. Okay. Cowboy, I don't know that they they think about it as as intently as Steve and Dave do. Okay. Um, the Juki 441 was never intended to be a, a leather machine. It was designed to sew harnesses, seatbelts, and stuff like that. Okay, I've used a 441 in a sail loft, building sails, putting the leech lines in. Okay, so that's an entirely different setup. The class four wouldn't work very well there. You'd have to modify it, right? You'd have to change the feed and apply different kinds of strategies to making the machine efficient in that environment. Okay, so the 441 an adaptation known as the class four and the cowboy version. I don't know enough about the cowboy, but um, I know that the leather machine company specifies um, slightly better springs in the tension devices. I can't speak for the cowboy, but I know that the, the class four is a pretty phenomenal sewing machine. Um, okay. So let's get back to the class 26 and leaving presser foot marks. Okay. Presser foot marks, are also considered tool marks, okay? Because it's not always the presser foot, okay? If you look at the Cobra Class 26, it's a compound feed machine. So the feed dog goes down and below and there's a hole, okay? So there's four edges right there that tend to burnish in marks on the bottom. And then it's a cylinder bed machine. So if you let the material drape off the left-hand side, then there's a hard edge there that can mark the leather too. Okay. So if you're raising the material too much and it's not really sitting on there, then you're going to stuff the left-handed edge of the presser foot into the leather and exacerbate the marks as well. Right, so we can loosen the presser feet, but if you're still handling the material incorrectly, it you you have no choice. 
it's going to leave marks regardless because if you can loosen the material or the presser foot enough to where it starts flagging the material comes up every single time the needle comes up and now you're skipping stitches and doing all those kinds of things but because of incorrect handling you're leaving marks on the material as well so keeping the material really flat and nice and dry tooled leather if it hasn't cured all the way is going to burnish more and leave more marks Okay. Some people talk about putting a little piece of leather underneath the presser foot and stuff like that. That helps a little bit. But again, that to me, that's dangerous because you're you're sliding a piece of leather with, with your hand underneath that, hoping to not leave marks. Okay, so um, proper technique and, and nice dry leather. Okay, and then the leather machine feet are pretty rounded they have soft edges there's nothing really sharp on it but they i mean a quality control problem could have slipped by and if you've got a really sharp edge then you can you know sand it down with some emery paper or something and make it real real round and soft edge so that it doesn't leave any marks then those are all tricks that you can do but a lot of it is just understanding that that tool marks are inevitable and me I expect them to be there, so I'm not surprised and I'm not frustrated by them. I just adapt because I I had a procedure like I might go back with a with a, um, a burnisher or polishing a spoon or something and wipe them out, or it might not even bother me if it's just a a, a belt buckle or something I'm sewing in. I don't care if it leaves a mark because it's going to be hidden anyway. I might tap it down with a mallet or something and and disguise the markings. Hi, Christine. I love you too. Anyway, so um, yeah, th those are kinds of kind of kind of some of the issues that that we have to have to learn and adapt to and, and make second nature when we're operating the equipment. I plan to have those mistakes or those issues in my production, and I add the necessary steps to disguise them before the product leaves. Okay, not being surprised by them is ninety percent of the game. Dan, I appreciate doing this, and I appreciate your friendship. Dan's a longtime um, friend of the Tips and Tricks group. He's here all the time. Let me take another sip. So anyway, that's the way it goes. It's not just me doing this thing. It's the admin group and the behind-the-scenes thing where, you know, it might sound like I know it all, but I don't. I ask Steve all the time, and I go, dude, we've got this problem going on. What do I do? And he goes, remember that I told you before? Like like the uh, presser foot timing thing. I always forget. Steve, what do I do? Oh, yeah, damn it. I, that, that, that little six-millimeter Allen behind the, 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 the needle bar. Oh, yeah, duh. But sometimes I have to revert to him, and and or or Bruce will remember, and I I forget, or Bruce will forget, and I remember, and we talk in the back room all the time. So we're empowered. We're lucky to have good people like Heather answering the phone over there, because that lady she works her butt off. She gets that stuff shipped out every day. Think about it, man. I have a shipping department, right? <laughs> but golly, typing. I, I type with my one finger like this, or I use voice to text, right? So, you know, that's a hassle. She's quick on that keyboard. Click, 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 boom, it's gone. It's on its way, bye-bye. And then you get an email with, with you know, the shipping clerk has, has shipped your package. Expect it. Here's your tracking number. The miracles of modern convenience. But, you know, the technology is useless without good people like Heather helping and, and keeping the, the, the system running. The whole sewing machine thing without people like like Steve, you know, innovating stuff and people like Vince, you know, assembling it correctly. You know, this whole system, it's it's awesome. Teresa, buy the best that you can afford. Oh, yeah, all the time. The latest thing we got in my shop, Pam did it, uh, is this machine called the Cricket. Have you ever seen one of these things? You know... We bought it at Michael's. You know, I just was bagging on 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 home crafting stuff like that, right? And I've been wanting to get a laser cutter for a long time, okay? But um, 
the cricket is basically a plotter and i don't know if you know what a plotter is but plotter printers push the material the paper back and forth and the the print head goes right and left okay so if if you want to draw a diagonal line the head is going to go across to the right or to the left and the paper is going to move away so the paper moving away and the the head going will draw a diagonal okay so the paper is moving back and forth and back and forth and the head is going back back and forth but they replace the pen or the stylus with a knife just think about that for a minute you upload an image and then it cuts the image out of the cardboard or the paper or the leather. Hold on one sec. Let me go get one. Here's a bag of stuff. I've got to make a guitar strap. It's got a bunch of inlay in it. Oh, my God. I'm, like, putting it off and putting it off because... I don't want to cut all that sh stuff. You almost heard me cuss. <laughs> but look at this. Okay. Here's the cutout. Where's the top? Okay, look. Can you see? It's just a hole in a piece of leather, right? But here it is. Look, it's a girl... I don't know if you can see it. It's a girl standing on one foot, holding a guitar over her head. It would have taken me a half an hour to cut this, and it would have all been crooked. This is an applique, okay? This is the negative, the 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 cutout where it came out, okay? So I'm going to put a piece of black leather. Let me see if I can use my tablet as a background. Can you see? That shows it a little bit better. So it's a guitar strap with this black inlay of a girl. Okay. It takes inlay and applique to a whole new level because now I can take art that I designed in Illustrator or Photoshop and translate it into a cut file and the little machine cut it. It cut this thing out in like 30 seconds. I can't do that. I have all the sharpest knives in the in the world. I can't cut like this at this precision. Are you kidding me? Here. Here's another one. This is the, the, the cutout, and here's the girl. She's standing here holding a guitar strap. Let me use the uh, tablet again to, to show what she looks like. Can you see? My finger's on her head, and she's kind of hunched over, and she's holding a guitar. Another 30 seconds with the machine. And the stupid machine was only 200 bucks. Go get one. Here's a pretty sleazy looking one. This one, the girl's kneeling down and has her hands on her hips. Can you see? It's really weird, this little itty bitty screen. I can barely see. But the cricket's a cool thing. The cricket makes some of this stuff really easy to do and hopefully we can you know do little things like names and and logos and 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 stuff like that a little more efficiently so for me i do a lot of biker related stuff so biker colors right the top rocker with their name simple font cut it out with the cricket glue it in place stitch it down with the 5550 bb might sound like a sales pitch, but it's not. The 5550BB is an awesome machine. If you've if you've never used one, go find one. Hopefully, uh, you know, life gets back to normal soon, and we can go to the trade shows, and and the machines are all there. You know, so you can try them. If you're ever in Los Angeles, my door is always open. You know, come over, come over and hang out with me. Come visit me. I'm, I'm 10 minutes away from Los Angeles International Airport. Come over. Meet a friend. Get a handshake. Get a pat on the back. Come over here and sew on some of my equipment, man. 
like this 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 is this is an open door man i want i want people to experience this stuff like i never had the luxury of of having really cool dedicated sewing machines available for me to 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 just come try the people that i that that were around when i was doing this stuff hid them from me how many times you've gone to the to the to the tailor shop or something and all the the workrooms in the back and they don't let you see you know why they do that? Because they don't want you to see that it only takes 10 seconds to sew a button on by hand. They don't, they don't want you to see that altering a pair of pants to make them fit only it takes about five minutes and they're going to charge you 50 bucks for that. Hemming a pair of pants takes about two minutes. An iron and the blind stitch. Brrr, done. They don't want you to know that they're charging you, you know, five bucks a minute. That's the old way of doing things. That's ridiculous. You know, I do an alteration. And you just, I do it while you wait. You don't have to get back in the car and come back again and again over some $20 job because I don't want you to see me do it. I don't want you to steal my trade secrets. Get out of here. That stuff is old. That's the old way of doing things. You can look up YouTube right now and go see how to alter a pair of pants. The secrets are gone. Your life and your time and your personal time is much more valuable than the secret. So come over, hang out, have a soda. I got some cold water in the fridge. Give you a bottle of water. Sit on my couch. Give you a tablet. You can play on the internet or watch TV while I while I do the alteration. If you want to stand over my shoulder, I'll show you how to do it. I'll even let you do it. I'll set the machine up and put the motor on real slow and you can click, 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 click. You can sew it yourself. I don't care. You know, there's enough work and enough customers out there that everybody can thrive with doing this stuff. If I spent every last moment of my life making a belt a second, I couldn't do 1% of the global population. I'm 59 years old. Think about it. It takes 7 billion seconds. How long is that? There's enough people out there where all of us can make a decent living on belts and on jackets and on pants. Motorcycle seats. Ed Bradley, that's all you. Have fun. <laughs> There's enough motorcycles out there that all of us could be making seats and there, there'd be plenty of customers. What is the weight of the leather? Okay, the, the leather that I was uh, just showing is a kid skin. It's a really high density um, cowhide. It's really dense and really thin. So it's about one to two ounce. It cuts great. Um, I've done some of the upholstery material. It's thicker, but it's got a lot of nap on the back. So I kind of tend to um, sand it off. I take it on the, on the, the skiver doesn't skive it off clean enough. So I take it and put it on a, on a, on a belt sander. And I put the belt sander head flat. And then I just kind of very lightly polish off some of the fuzz so that it doesn't clog up the cutter. <laughs> Jeff Bradley says it's his last motorcycle seat. Ha <laughs> ha. Famous last words. You'll be doing them. I do them every once in a while. I just don't like to do them. I like making clothing, jackets and pants. You know, there's a reason for that. I make leather pants because a, a pair of denim jeans is about 150 to 300 bucks. Pair of leather pants cost me about a hundred bucks, hundred and fifty bucks, but I sell them for about a grand. So the time invested into making them is much more profitable and makes it worth doing it. it. Takes me, you know, three or four hours to build them. It takes about two hours to do the consultation. That time costs me time. Right. So I have to talk to the customer, figure out exactly what they want, I have to do the fittings, I have to create the patterns, a custom fit pattern, and then I have to build the garment and then deliver it and do, you know, do do a lifetime warranty thing. My, my, if, if you damage my clothes, I'm not going to charge you to fix them five years from now. I don't care. A, a 10 minute alteration or a repair. It's on the house, man. Customer service. Adam McInerney. I have a local leather worker's. Who are you that they think I'm their competitor? I always tell them. Well, that's because they're short-minded and they're not creative enough to do their own marketing. That's their own damn fault.
Gary, yes, there is a flatbed attachment to help keep the material lay flat as mentioned. Yes, there is. But, you know, it's all about technique. It's about how you hold the leather. Okay. So imagine my fist is the edge of the throat. Okay. And my left hand here, I'll bridge the end of the end of the throat with my hand like this. So it just holds it flat. I don't want the material to drape off the end like this. So I don't have to use the flatbed. I just hold my hand the way it keeps it off that edge and it doesn't make that mark like that. So it's just about figuring out an adaptation to make it work for yourself. But the key there is understanding how the machine is making these marks, right? So it all comes with a little time and a little bit of experience. So go make a hundred of something. And by the time you've made that 90th one, you got it all figured out. Okay. And then by the time you get really good at it, you'll have a bunch of gray hair and sore arthritic fingers. Anyway, I'm just kidding. But, you know, that's how that's how you do these adaptations. You just kind of got to figure it out. I've, I've been doing this stuff a long time. I've destroyed more leather than, than a lot of folks. Think about it. Dave Spiegel sending me a text message. I'm on my wife's phone and listening. Hi, Dave. Dude, you know what? You've made everybody's life so good just by being you. I have a Cobra Class 26 I want to sew on 17 ounce on 17 ounce veg tan leather, about three eighths inch thick. It's three pieces of leather glued together. What needle size and thread would you suggest? Well, I mean, anything that's 17 ounces, three eighths inch thick, um, you're gonna need 138 thread, okay? And probably a 23 or a 24 needle. And you're gonna have to sew pretty slow so you don't flex the needle as it's piercing. Phil Kelton. Tell me about it. Makes too much stuff. I make too much stuff. Yeah, Phil makes some phenomenal stuff. If you haven't seen his work, man, pff, come on. He's one of our longtime users here. Let's see what else is coming through. Getting text messages. Mandy, oh, my client. And Pam is almost out of battery. I guess she left the room. She's at a photo shoot right now. I was supposed to go help fashion style a photo shoot for for um, Fiera. We've got a little starlet getting ready to release her album. They're shooting the um, the album cover with a bunch of clothes that we've made. Dave, oh, Dave wants you to use a twenty two oh seven and a twenty three needle. Dave got lots of support. So look forward to seeing the 5550 uh, BB instructional video coming out pretty soon. It's going to be a playlist. Do you guys like the long video or the playlist segmented thing? Use the, uh, the Cobra Class 4 in that 35-minute video versus the Cobra Class 26 with like 10 little segments in there. Which do you prefer? What do you guys think? Okay, Vivian is asking a question. Do you find one pattern doesn't always work for different types of leather that are the same weight? Like you'll get to a seam. You'll get, hold on. Oh, it's scrolling faster than I can keep up. Okay, the same weight. Like you'll get to a seam and the leather needs to be cut, but a different leather sews together perfectly. Well, um, that tends to, to, to create a problem at the machine, but the pattern itself has still got to assemble. It's got to be balanced. A needs to fit B, right? Okay, so if it's heavy and you're going to climb up an obstacle, 
then remember earlier we were talking about that brain dump while I'm teaching sewing. I've got to remember that there's going to be an obstacle coming up. Okay, so I'm sewing along. It's just two plies, and now I'm going to cross a seam where another seam is there, and now all of a sudden it's four or five plies thick. Right? So the needle comes up, and I don't want to just jam into it and then have the presser foot unintentionally stop the thing and then two or three stitches of, of, of incorrectly sewn stuff. Right? So I approach it. I know it's coming. I pre-plan to stop early. I get there, get that last stitch settled before the obstacle gets there. And now I might move the presser foot, hand cycle the machine so that as the presser foot rises, I can allow it to guide underneath the foot and get that foot completely up onto the obstacle, hand cycle the machine so that when the needle goes through that area where it's it's possibly going to deflect the needle and break it. I hand guide it really slow so that it pierces and cuts and then makes it down the feed dog or through the throat and then get a good stitch. Okay, because I stopped and planned for it. But if I just go, you know, willy nilly, boom, break the needle and then I'm going into the tinker's dam mode and grumpy and having to find a new needle in the screwdriver and yelling at myself for being an idiot that's no fun so yeah to answer your question yes i do find that i have to adjust but i don't need to adjust the pattern i just need to adjust myself at the machine and and know that it's coming and adjust my technique so that was a very good question thank you for that jeff bradley prefers the playlists i like that i kind of figured that that's the better way i'd rather have one long video Okay, so Hank, or ha, you can um, play the whole, we, here's the way we make them. We make them so that they're playlists, but we put them in there in segments so that's one, two, three, and four in the way it would play. So you can play all if you want to watch them that way. The only problem is that you have to endure the, the intro credits and the exit credits. But, um, so thank you for answering that would sew without the thread first and punch the holes then thread the machine and then sew the okay so phil phil is talking about technique that he uses for sewing heavy heavy erica likes the long video where are the machine instructional videos millie we have a um a youtube channel it's called al bain just search for my name and in the pinned post at the top of the page you can see the pin post and there's a link to the channel in there Okay, so um, please go like and subscribe. And if you use the little bell, you'll get a notification when we upload a new video. I hate that part. You know, all the YouTube videos are always asking you to like and subscribe and hit the bell. But I guess it's a necessary evil. So um, go to the Al Bain channel, click like, subscribe to it. And if you hit the little bell, you'll get an email telling you that Al Bain uploaded a new video. So there you go, Millie. Adam, I like the playlist. allows me to find what he's looking for without scrolling through a long video. Playlist like chapters. Yes, sir. Christina Long. Hi, Allison. How are you, sweetheart? I haven't seen you in so long, honey. I miss you. I want to see you. Let's get together after this quarantine thing. Um, I don't think she's referring to ply slippage. I think she's referring to um, obstacles as they approach the needle. Millie's going to go and subscribe to the channel. Anyway, so you guys having fun? I'm having a good time. I got a smile on my face. And we've been doing this for an hour and 38 minutes. Oh, my gosh. No wonder I need to take another sip. Here, look, I got a Jack Daniels cup. I swiped it from the Rainbow Bar and Grill. They have these giant parking lot. Well, they used to have these giant parking lot parties. Party in the parking lot. And they'd set up a stage back there and have some live rock and roll. And uh, they, they were throwing these things away, basically. It's a metal mixer cup, you know, for shaking, not stirred. So there's two cups. One interacts with this one. They'll pour the drink in there and shake them up and kind of swipe this one. 
nice big cup. Jack Daniels, my favorite alcoholic beverage for the adults in the in the crowd. I don't drink too much anymore. <laughs> I used to drink a lot when I was a kid, but you know, I'm kind of getting older and I don't don't want to be wearing out the hardware too early. So just a little bit. Are these adjustments to the Bob and Winder? Are there adjustments on the class 26? Um, we have a lot of videos regarding the um, tabletop winders. Okay. So the class 26 has a tabletop winder on it. There's, um, a couple of videos that are featuring that they may be in the other playlists um or for the class 18 there's definitely a video somewhere on the 26 because i remember shooting it um but what are you trying to adjust okay so the the winder is going to adjust where it feeds so if it's feeding too much on the right or on the left you would adjust the little mount where the tension device is so that it it just so loosen the screw and move the, the little guide to the right or to the left to center it up. And then there's the finger, which pops it open. There's a screw on top of there that will um, adjust how full it gets. So the key there is to not let it overfill and spill off and then wind on the spindle and waste a bunch of thread. Otherwise, um, it sucks. When is the refreshments going to be served? I got one glass that I swipe from the rainbow, and it's got about a quarter left full of water, by the way. Water, H2O. Oh, my God, Mandy Lyon's calling me. Hey, Mandy, I'm doing a Facebook Live thing. I have to call you back unless you have a no quick problem. question. No problem. All right, I'll, t I'll call you back, and then uh, we'll get you, get your fitting done. I'll call you back. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. The winder does not click off. Okay, so there's a little finger that goes in between the spool, and then you'll you'll see a screw, a flathead. Maybe it's a hybrid, a flathead and a um, Phillips screw there. Um, by turning it one way or the other, the finger is going to go in toward the axle of the winder or away. So maybe flex it in closer to the axle and then it'll 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 push it and disengage it yes phil it's water you want to see i'll take another sip for you imagine drinking this much jack daniels probably be needing to go to the hospital for alcohol poisoning sure it's water phil always a comedian but this guy talented have you ever seen any of his snakeskin stuff he sent me a couple of snakeskins a couple of months ago man these things are so soft it's ridiculous can't wait to do a little uh inlay with the cricket with some snakeskin behind it oh my gosh can you think just imagine that anyway so i'm pretty excited about the cricket the only problem is that i have to learn photoshop now So, three weeks, maybe a month ago, I saw a post on Facebook that said free to a good home. And this fellow was giving away or wanting to get rid of a four-color screen printing machine. Okay. So, silk screen um, for printing T-shirts, right? Automatically, Tool Whore Wednesday, I'm ready. I'll take it. And he goes, oh, I was thinking about calling you. I didn't know if you wanted it, but he was going to call me. And uh, is that a margarita machine behind that coat? Where the the class 26 is over there. Anyway, so uh, I get this screen printing machine. right? And then uh, I start focusing some energy on learning how to print because you know, my industry died. All the entertainers, the entertainment went away with the quarantine, right? There's no rock bands touring and there's no television. There's no, none of the normal activities that bring me my customers are, are happening. So I got to adapt just like everybody else. So this opportunity to, to print t-shirts, 
I live near Venice Beach, and there's a big community of of t-shirt vendors over there. I could make some t-shirts and hopefully go sell them over there or whatever, right? So I get the screen printing machine and start printing. I figure I'll make myself an Albane for leather t-shirt. Like that one over there. And uh, I'm down to the printing supply house, learning, learning, learning my... Uh, I'm, I'm learning how to do how to do screen printing stuff and the owner of the company says hey I gotta talk to you because you're in here too much you're 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 spending a lot of money and you're probably using the old business model that doesn't really work you're creating yourself a, a low income job okay step into my office over here and he goes, look, you, you, you've, you've discovered screen printing. You think it's going to be the answer to some of your income problems, but you're really going to create a job where you're, it's just a lot of labor and you're, you're, you're dealing with a lot of chemicals and it's just, it's not a good day at work. Kind of sounds like I don't want to have the tinkers dam. Remember at the beginning of our conversation today? Okay. I'm all ears. He goes, you can make about 50 to a hundred shirts a day. And it's hard. There are people with state-of-the-art machines that can do 500 an hour. And they buy in such bulk that they can get the shirts so much cheaper than you can. Why, why compete against them? Why not resource them? You have to have a printing machine so that you can make your samples up. But then broker it to these other cats. Okay. Then why am I hogging up precious space in my shop with this machine? Oh, my mom is calling me. I got I got to take this. Hold on one sec. Reponente. Esto, es, es, estoy uh, utilizando una um, Facebook Live. Que es, estoy en cámara. Te, te llamo en unos minutos, okay? Bye. All right, so there you go. That's me speaking Spanish, and that's my mom. So if she calls, I got to answer that. But uh, I told her I'll call her right back. <laughs> mom's, mom's a little older these days. I'm, not, you know, I'm 59. I'm gonna be, she, mom, mom, mom's a, a little older than I am. So when she calls, I got to stop. Anyway, but um, so he says, go utilize these people's services. But you know, the barrier to entry is expensive. When, when you're going to go hire somebody like that, they're going to want like a minimum of 100 and they're going to charge you for the shirt and the printing and all that stuff. So the barrier to entry is usually between 500 and and $1,000, depending on the complexity of your art. And <laughs> I, I already hung up with her, Phil. So uh, I uh, discovered that I can print on a piece of paper called a transfer paper. So the ink goes onto this paper and I put an adhesive into it and stuff like that. And then I can transfer that onto the shirt later. Okay. So um, rather than print on the shirt and commit the cost of the shirt and all that stuff, I print onto a transfer paper and then I put those into a filing cabinet. So now I've got a thousand blank t-shirts in my spare bedroom that's where the cat doesn't go so they don't get cat fuzz on them and i've got about 10 customers that all have their art in my filing cabinet so customer number one sells a medium and a small i go get a medium and a small and i take it and put it in the transfer printing machine and print the two now he's committed to the cost of the shirt as it's coming out of the machine, I fold it up and stuff it into a mailing envelope, push print on the label maker, slap his label on it. He never had to touch it, and it's gone. And he's made his money, and I get a PayPal. Beep, beep. It's changed the world for us over here because I can do about 100 shirts a day in about two hours. And the barrier to entry is only about 200 bucks instead of $1,000. They don't have to inventory anything. I do the fulfillment. 
They don't have to stock the weird sizes that never sell. And everybody wins. Okay, so for now, I'm running a leather shop. I've got a bunch of guitar straps I have to make. And then I, I, I do a part-time thing where I'm printing t-shirts. And I'm able to keep my, my, my household, hopefully. And uh, I'm, a, I'm creating income for these musicians that are having a hard time making money. And they're capitalizing on their popularity. So I'm making Johnny, Johnny, Johnny t-shirts and Vampire Rockstar t-shirts and Jurassic Sam and Gabe Masca. And then i um, doing um, Gabriel O'Connor. He's got like a theme based off of um, the Terminator got some of those i'm doing a really cool thing with a, a little boy his he's he's six or seven now his name is noah jagger he's the grandson of mark kendall the guitar player from great white okay so i talked to his grandma and i said hey you know what why don't we start a college fund and make some merchandise shirts and all the profit money goes into his college fund so she's got about 10 years to raise 30 or 40 grand to get her grandson into college that doesn't tap into their personal pocket. And then surplus money, put it into a trust fund and create a musician's um, scholarship fund for other kids who might want to learn how to play and can't afford lessons or whatever. And then the Noah Jagger scholarship fund. So that's going to be happening really soon here based off of T-shirts, off of someone's generosity by giving me this machine and creating the ability for us to print and then ultimately serve our people indirectly. So now there's going to be a scholarship fund for these kids who I'll probably never meet. But Noah Jagger and his college fund will allow that to happen. I feel pretty good, man. I got to do something cool for some people. And it's ongoing. Pay it forward, right? Let's live that. Let's do something nice for each other. Let's do something nice for a stranger. How would it be if everybody was doing that? How would our society be? We wouldn't be having these struggles that we have with the Black Lives Matter thing. God, I wish that would just stop. I don't know how to do that. The cops have to have authority. They have to be able to enforce the authority that we give them. I'm not condoning their abuses, though. Come on. Let's just be nice. <sighs> Phil, I did say hi to my mom, but I didn't tell her. I'll tell her. I'll tell her that you did say hi, though. We still have 34 people watching Al's talking head. Ha <laughs> ha! An hour and 52 minutes. I'm going to cut this off at two hours. So you guys have eight minutes to ask me a question. Is everybody having fun? I'm having fun. This is a great day for me. My class 17 knob is not. Okay. On my class, my 17, the tension knob is not releasing the thread when I lift the presser. What do you think is wrong? Okay. So does it. Release the thread if you lock the feet up. Okay, so look from the side, lock the foot up, and see if the discs are moving. If they're not, we have a video um, detailing the anatomy of the upper tension device on YouTube. And you'll see how that's put together. And there's a washer in there that has a bar across it, and that little pin pushes against that little bar, and that forces the discs to come apart. It could be a couple things. It could be that the system's dirty and not moving. So if you take it apart and clean it, that might just solve it. Or it could be that the little bar is bent or broken. And if it is, it's, you know, very cheap to get a new washer. So the leather machine company probably just toss you one because it can't even be a dollar for that thing. But... Um, Use the finger deploy method. Does everybody understand how the finger deploy method works? You raise the foot and you reach in between the take-up lever and pull some thread out and then pull the workpiece out and guide the thread back so it doesn't tangle up. We've got a video on that system too. 
Rudy, no. What? Okay, so try it. Try locking the feet up and then see what happens. And then if not, then uh, they're not. So the discs are not moving when you lock the feet up. So go find that video, the anatomy, and then um, take it apart, clean it, and see if the, if there's a uh, the, the little D washer, the one with the bar in it is broken. The 20 is having issues with tension knob spring, sewing fine when in the middle of the run extension spring loosens somehow and leaves slack on back. The the 20 having issues with the tension knob spring. So you find in the middle of the run and then spring loosens somehow and leaves tension. Okay. Um, what would loosen the tension device? So you thinking that the knob is getting looser and looser? If, if it is, there's a little indexing ratchet in there. Maybe your upper device is too loose so that there's not enough spring tension pushing the ratchets together. So if that's the case, then tighten the bobbin tension a little bit so that you have to tighten the needle side a little bit more, and that'll put more tension against the ratchet and prevent the knob from rolling out. How often do I change needles? I change needles every eight hours of production. Okay, so if I'm using the machine about half an hour a day, about every other week. If I'm using it full time every day, okay? Same thing with oiling, okay? The thing with needles is even if you've never had a malfunction, the friction and the heat is changing the temper of the needle, okay? So the needle over time is getting old because the, the metal is getting harder and harder, and then eventually it's going to break by itself, okay? So... Um, you don't want an old needle to malfunction and then make a tinker's dam, right? So change those needles about every eight hours of operation and spare yourself the hassle. When I'm trying, Wanda says, oh, my class 26, when I'm trying to do a back stitch, it is not catching and knotting in the leather. I hit my reverse lever as the needle is coming up, am I doing something wrong? Um, typically, no. You should be able to cycle at just about any time, okay? But is it skipping or is it leaving a weird loop? Because that's a different problem. If it's skipping the stitch, then uh, the machine might be slightly out of time, and then we can discuss how to time it again. Um, we have the little lowered needle trick. Okay, so if you look at your um, needle bar, there's a screw that holds the needle in, and just above that, there's a little itty bitty hole. Okay, we call that the spy hole. So shine a light in there, and you should be able to see the very top of the needle inside that little spy hole. Okay, loosen the, th the screw and lower the needle so that you only have half of the hole covered with the top of the needle. So basically, you're advancing the needle. Tighten the screw and then test sew. Okay. If it corrects the problem, then you know that the needle bar is slightly out of time and then you adjust appropriately. Okay. If it doesn't, if it makes it worse, then the needle bar may be out of time in the opposite direction, which requires a different adjustment. But um, you can tell right away whether you're slightly out of time or not. It, it's only going to be one or two degrees, and then it's going to be intermittently skipping or skipping drastically. Hope that answers the question. And um, if you continue having problems, don't um, hesitate to make a, a post in the tips and tricks, and then we will help you guide, work, work your way through it in the future. Alan, do you feel like I answered your question? If not, then again, feel free to um, ask it again in the normal feed so that way um, we can get you get your, your situation resolved for you. Okay, we're at one hour, 59 minutes and seven seconds. I said that I was going to cut it off at two hours. I want you all to realize that um, this is our first time. I hope it went over well. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that I was able to shed some light on some on some mysteries. 
Um, I feel really good doing this this forum. I, it gives me great satisfaction to be able to help people in in these endeavors. So don't feel like um, you're intruding in my life or, or interfering. If you call me and I'm busy, I'll just tell you, I'll call you right back. Um, but I don't like receiving phone calls without a post already because then the audience doesn't get to benefit from your learning experience too. So um, that's that's kind of how we build the archive because if you use the search engine, you can see all this stuff in the in the in the archive and you might not ever have to even post a question. And um, that way the audience learns from your mistake. And if, if uh, there's something that we don't know how to fix, we learn too, because we'll have our backroom discussion and we'll talk about it and we'll come up with a logical solution to help people come through on the back end. So try not to call me right away. Try not to call the leather machine company because the answers are all here. We've been doing this. This is getting on the ninth or 10th year. So everything's been asked. It's whether you can find it or not that makes it you know, complicated. But um, we're happy to do this. Let's uh, reach out and thank Bruce Brand for all of his effort because without him, we'd be dead in the water. Same with uh, Bruce, Dave, Heather, Vince, and Tony at the Leather Machine Company because without their um, backroom consultations, we wouldn't be able to do this either. You know, I, I'm pretty good at this stuff, but my my memory isn't what it used to be, so I refer to them constantly. And if I call them, it's a two-minute conversation, and if you call them, it's a two-hour conversation. So let's let them... Um, continue doing the good work that they do by not ringing the phone. If you need to buy something or a replacement part or whatever, that's a different story, you know, but um, that's the purpose of the tips and tricks to allow um, them to stay at work doing the work that they do. And um, I don't mind answering these questions. Steve, um, Dave doesn't mind, you know, in the tips and tricks, it, it's good for everybody. And uh, try to be kind to each other. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, we'll try to do more and more of these. And uh, we only ask for one thing. Please pay it forward. <laughs>